Sit down, KSI. Get out of the way, Logan Paul. There's a new boxer on the block. After many hours of welding, I have created the ultimate boxing champion, a sea moth with the arms of a prawn suit. Good luck to even the strongest opponent when trying to take on this titanium armored powerhouse with arms strong enough to snap bone and smash rocks. There isn't any human opponent who could possibly compete with my hydraulically powered monstrosity, so that gave me an idea. What if my opponent wasn't human at all? So today I'm going to attempt to knock out every single reaper in Subnautica. No other arms, no torpedoes and no drills. This is going to be a fair boxing match with claw arms only. Now each reaper has 5000 health and my arms are an exact copy of the prawn suits, meaning that each punch I land will deal 50 damage. So I need to hit each reaper 100 times in order to score a knockout. So as Subnautica has over 25 reaper leviathans, I will have to successfully punch reapers 2500 times in order to knock out every reaper on 4546B. Okay, this was going to be tough. So to prepare myself for this challenge, I created what would become my standard brawler Seamoth build. This would include two claw arms to land punches, a level 3 depth module upgrade to get me deep enough to take on the furthest down reapers, a sonar upgrade to help more easily spot danger noodles in the dark, and a solar charger for recharging my power cells while on the move and in combat. And finally, through a perimeter defense system for good measure for getting myself out of a tough spot if I'm caught off guard. It's safe to say I'll also be keeping a repair tool or two handy for on the fly repairs, because something tells me I'll be taking a lot of damage in the ring during this match. So as I said, Subnautica has 25 reapers in total. 10 of these can be found in the crash zone, 8 in the dunes, and 7 in the mountains. So my plan was to take on each area one by one and clear out all the dangerous beasts. I decided to start my challenge at the back of the Aurora and take on the group of reapers towards the engines. And this is where I realized that this was not going to be an easy task. As you can see, the reaper's hitbox doesn't actually run down the length of its body, meaning if I hit the reaper from behind and try to avoid its nice gleaming teeth, I actually wouldn't do any damage to it at all. I had to get right into the danger zone in order to deal any damage, meaning I had to land hits on the reaper towards the front end of its body, which was a lot more risky. This also meant that knocking out just one reaper was going to take forever, as I'd only be able to score a few hits before it moved in another direction and I'd have to chase it down all over again. And that's before I discovered my boxing champion's fatal flaw. Now, as you might know, most boxers have two arms, and so does my Seamoth, so what's the problem? Well, due to the way the Seamoth arms mod is configured, I could only use one arm at a time, which effectively halved my damage output almost catastrophically. The Seamoth arm upgrade works in a similar way to most other activatable Seamoth upgrades, meaning I had to purposely select an arm on the hotbar in order to use it, and if I wanted to use the other arm, I would have to switch to that one manually before it could be used. Now, this wasn't impossible, but it was quite difficult to do while also piloting the Seamoth and trying to stick close to the Reaper in order to land hits. I could use the scroll wheel to move between the two arms, but this method of attack just wasn't very efficient, especially when I had to maneuver myself in case the Reaper turned on me in order to attack. But just when I thought this challenge was going to be way too difficult to complete, I had an interesting idea. When a Reaper attacks a Seamoth, it will deal between 40 to 60% damage, which does mean I lose a lot of health, but importantly, it shouldn't kill me. But when the Reaper grabs the Seamoth in this way, it gives me an opportunity to give it a black eye and punch it squarely in the face. This means I also don't have to steer the Seamoth, which would then allow me to switch between both arms quickly and land more punches. After the Reaper lets me go, I would simply have to jump out, complete a quick repair job, and I'd be good to go for round two. The only thing I had to be careful of here was taking collision damage before the Reaper got a hold of me, as if the Reaper rammed me or I crashed into it before it tried to bite me into little pieces, it could end up destroying my Seamoth. So with my new plan of attack worked out, all I had to do now was drive headfirst into a Reaper's mouth. Now, what could possibly go wrong? I decided to stick with trying to clear the crash zone first, but I did give up on the Reapers at the back of the Aurora for now and head down towards the front, where I could pick off the lonely Reaper that sits between the Aurora and the Bulb Zone. I began my attack with this new method of getting purposely caught and then unleashing a blitz of punches once the Reaper had a hold of me, and then jumping out once it had let me go in order to do some quick repairs. This method was working well, but I realised I had forgot to include a depth module in this Seamoth, so I had to go get one of those before I could go deeper and try to finish off the Reaper when it went too far below the waves. But this was it. I could feel I was closing in on my first knockout, and nothing could stop me now. Uh, apart from this massive collision damage which took off 50 health before the Reaper even got a hold of me, and that was the end of my first Seamoth. So far it was 1-0 to the Reapers in this challenge. But after making another Seamoth and getting back into the ring, it wasn't long until I had my first knockout. One down, 
24 to go. I continued to work my way around the front of the Aurora, taking on each Reaper as I found them, in a cycle of getting caught, landing some punches, and then conducting repairs. I actually started to get into a bit of a rhythm here, and the knockouts started to pile up. Weirdly, some of the Reapers that I knocked out would still move as they sank to the bottom of the ocean, as if their muscles had a mind of their own, even after being taken down, while others would just lock up like a wooden board, not moving an inch. Now, one problem I wasn't expecting was actually losing the Reapers after they had attacked. It turns out these giant danger noodles, when coupled with the coming of nighttime and a general lack of vision when getting deeper under the water, meant that it was common for me to actually lose the Reaper I'd been fighting entirely. This is where sonar upgrades came in quite useful for being able to relocate these pesky leviathans that would often just disappear without a trace. But in fairness, this wasn't entirely my fault, as Reapers can also apparently phase through reality to a different dimension whenever they please, so sometimes they would just swim into the floor at random, which would leave me scratching my head as to where they'd gone. This meant I would sometimes end up picking a fight with a completely different Reaper that was still at full health as I thought it was the one I was just fighting, which meant I would sometimes hit a Reaper what I thought was way too many times before knocking it out, only to realise I'd actually been fighting a completely different enemy. Interestingly, once a Reaper was knocked out, it seemed to partly lose its ability to phase through the world. Its lower body could still phase through, but its head became solid and stopped it slipping any further into the void. Moving towards the back of the Aurora, I had a similar issue in that there were so many Reapers so close together. It was hard to figure out which one I had been focusing on and which ones hadn't taken any damage. So I went a while here without scoring any knockouts at all, as the damage I was dealing was being spread out across multiple targets. The other problem I had here was that with so many Reapers so close together, it was possible that one could attack me and let go, and then another could attack me before I had the chance to conduct any repairs. It was also pretty dark in this area at night when coupled with the crash zone radiation, so it was quite easy to get taken by surprise. So it's safe to say I did lose a few Seamoths in this area, although eventually I did manage to clear the back of the Aurora and the wider crash zone. It was now time to move over to the mountains to begin my next set of knockouts. Now the mountains is one of Subnautica's biggest biomes, and without the central point of the Aurora to guide me like in the crash zone, each Reaper took a little bit more work to find. To start with, I didn't run into any problems, as having seven danger noodles swimming around meant that it was pretty easy to find them. But as one by one I knocked out more and more Reapers, finding the last ones that were hiding became more and more difficult. And again, with them phasing through reality at will, this made the job even tougher. Just look at this guy sat inside the mountain island. Here I was wondering where he was because I could hear him but couldn't find him, and he's just chilling inside the mountain. So I had to wait for him to finally decide to come out again before making my attack. Again, I lost my fair share of Seamoths in this area too, even with the Reapers so far apart. Collision damage was causing me a major headache, meaning I needed to build more and more Seamoths as the collision damage taken seemed to be pretty random, which made it hard to predict when my Seamoth might be crushed. I didn't want to use the perimeter defense system when it wasn't needed, as that meant I would lose out on possible damage I could deal, but this also meant I would often lose an entire Seamoth instead. Moving into the dunes, I faced similar problems to those I'd faced in the mountains. To start with, figuring out which Reapers I had damaged and which I hadn't proved almost impossible, as many of the Reapers were close together, and they also continued to slip into the pocket dimension whenever they felt like it. I also got ganked around here by a Ghost Leviathan from the Void, as this Reaper right here managed to grab me and drag me over the crater's edge, but luckily I managed to backpedal my way out of there without dying. And I had a similar issue when trying to finish off this Reaper who apparently likes to swim into the Void for no good reason. I'm not quite sure that this was what the individual who launched this time capsule I found in the area meant when they said they were going deeper, but shout out to you if you left this message. Again, the sonar module in this area was super useful in finding Reapers that had wandered off into the darkness that surrounded me, but as the number of Reapers slowly dropped and I continued my march towards the title of Subnautica Heavyweight Champion, it became so much harder to actually find the last few Reapers that I could hear roaring in the distance. I started to spend more and more time just trying to find Reapers to knock out, as I still hadn't hit the magic 25 number, but I eventually did manage to find the last one I had missed hidden away in the mountains who'd managed to avoid me when I cleared that area. And then everything went quiet. There wasn't a single roar. In an ocean that is normally dominated by the ever-present sight of a reaper, there was now only deathly silence, a world devoid of one of its staple predators. Ironically, the only other hostile leviathans left before the lava zone were the ghost leviathans, which is what the last of 45-46B's reapers had now become. Quite fitting, really. During this challenge, I ended up losing 12 sea moths to 25 reapers, so that's a knockout rate of around 2 to 1. That's not too bad, but could definitely have been improved if you wanted to min max more effectively and correctly managed your collision damage. So for now, I think it's time to hang up my gloves. I've proven beyond doubt that Reapers cannot compete with the might of the 
Seamoth in the ring. But if you want to see me undergo even more Subnautica suffering, then click right here to see me attempt to build Subnautica's biggest ever land base. Because who even needed water anyway?